Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that God's desire is not just that you and I would struggle our way through surviving, but that we would live. The Bible's word for that is overflow. That you and I would experience so much of God's hope and joy and peace and power that it would be literally more than we can hold that we would live with such an awareness of his presence that it would spill over to everyone in our path. And Romans 15 says that this life is available for you and the only qualifier is that it's released as we trust in him. I'm so excited to dive into our new series, We Live, where together we'll look at how to build our lives around four values that set you free to trust and walk with God. Intimacy, expectancy, restoration, and community. You were born for a life of overflow. Come with us and find how we live. Um, it's so good to be with you today. I have just the, the joy of sort of giving this message that's been settling in my heart for like three months, but I don't think it'll take me three months to share it. It'll probably take my whole life. It's just so, um, so good for my soul, this um, message about evangelism. I have good, good news for us today. Somebody say, I love good news. news. We live as Overflow Church. We live as believers as workers in the field. We live as workers in the field. But the good news, and that's good news in and of itself, to know our purpose, to know where we're supposed to go. But the the better news is that when we go into that field, the Lord is saying that right now, for such a time as this, the harvest is ripe. It is huge. Fields and fields and fields of harvest. And we are the workers that have been called to gather that harvest. See, there's two purposes for us today. And there's a call on this church specifically and on each of us individually. And that is why we're here. There is a purpose for the whole world to know the good news of Jesus Christ. That's our field. And they are the harvest that we get to gather in and bring in. Now, Overflow Church has a mission. We live to receive God's love to everyone everywhere. And he's given us this prompt that your everyone everywhere is, starts in Brandon. Starts in Brandon, goes to the bay, and then beyond. That means the, the harvest fields go on forever all around the world. And that it's huge and ripe everywhere we look. And so the purpose of today is to activate the gifts in you that you need to go out into the field. To release the evangelistic grace that's been given to you. Now, if you haven't taken the five-fold test, go to the website on the, on the banners that, that flip through. You click on that and you take that test. It'll take you five minutes. And you'll notice that in, it doesn't matter what your top one is. In every single one of us, there's a measure of evangelistic grace and anointing in us. And my job today, my great privilege is to um, allow that to be full, more fully released in you so that you can be equipped to go do the work of the Lord. But we first need to anticipate and ready ourselves for that work, for our hearts and for the season of harvest that is right now. We've been having these words come to us over and over and over. And of course, it's for Overflow Church, but it is for the full body of Christ to know that right now is a season of harvest. Are you ready? Are you ready? Mark 4.26 says, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like... Anytime he says the kingdom of God is like, he is giving us a heavenly perspective that we really need to pay attention to. Because he's showing us something that happens on earth that is, that is what heaven brings down. So it's like this in heaven, and so it will be like this on earth. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. See, the earth produces the crop on its own. Say, I don't produce the crop. Oh, you're free. Church, you are free. You don't produce the crop. Okay? 
You plant the seed, that's what the farmer does. And day and night he goes to bed and wakes up and it grows. First the leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed. And finally the grain, grain ripens. And so all that's happening, and then it says this, as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle for the harvest time has come. So that worker goes back into the field. He's been watching. Is it now? Is it now? Is it now? And he sees it pop up and he knows, it's now. It's time for me to go. It's time for me to move. It's time for me to get back in that field. So my question for us today is, are we ready? Are we anticipating this grain to be ripe for the harvest? Are we anticipating the purpose and the plans that God has for us, specifically in our sphere of influence, in Brandon, the Bay, and beyond. The next purpose for us today is to equip and enable you to work as a work, to go out as a worker in the field, to put the tools in your hand. Joel 3.13 says, swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. How many of you have a sickle in your garage? <laughs> nice. We had somebody had, that had one in first service. That's awesome. If you have a sickle, you kind of understand what it is, but I thought for our context, we would use a good old-fashioned machete. I think most of us as believers need to be a little bit more equipped and know how to use this sucker. Our swords, right? I, ha I left it in its case so that you guys wouldn't ter be terrified. Okay. To equip and enable you as a worker in the field is to put these tools in your hands so you know how to harvest what's out there in the field. So I thought maybe a good idea to, to give you some context because we don't have harvests of wheat field. We don't see that. We see orchards, right, around here, strawberry fields, that kind of thing. And we pick those with our hands most of the time. But with grain, you need to harvest it with a sickle. And so um, I'm going to give you some insight. The Aruta family bought, not a field of grain, don't worry. We bought um, two and a half acres here in Brandon. It looks like, yeah, it's wild. It, it was owned by a landscaper previously, and they left a lot of stuff on the outside perimeter, and all of that has grown. Bushes and plants and grasses, just a, a myriad of, of Florida plant life, and it grows way high. But when we first um, got, we had it cut down a little bit, but when we first got the property, we wanted our girls to be able to go into the field, to be equipped for that. And so we bought them two things. We got them each a pair of rubber boots to protect their feet because they, they need that, right? They don't, we don't want to get in stuff in their feet. And then we bought them each 13, 11, and 6. They're on machete. <laughs> that is my 6-year-old with her machete cutting a piece of fruit that she found on the ground. Now, we didn't just say, here you go, have fun. We gave them some pointers, some ways to hold it. Um, equip them with it and put a cover on it so they didn't start swinging everywhere and you know when they're going on to the car. This is my oldest. And then there's another picture of my um, daughter, Myla. I love that she's holding it upside down. Do you know in the kingdom of God, he supplies you and provides you with a tool? And even when you hold it upside down, look what's in her hand. She's gotten something. She's like, I, I, I can hold it well enough to cut something. Maybe it's not the right way. But I, I, I used it, and I'll learn better next time. And so what I'm saying is if I can give a six-year-old, if we can give a six-year-old a literal and physical machete, I believe that each one of us, no matter our maturity in Christ, can be equipped spiritually to use the sickle to harvest what's been planted. Can we agree with that? Yes. Say, I can be equipped. Yes. Okay. So we get a little bit of a picture of what the sickle is, right? The purpose of all this is to join the work of the harvest, to join with all the other believers. Over and over as we were singing that song, I was, I was saying, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And he's saying, come saints. Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Oh, I'm moving, and the harvest is ripe. Are you coming? Are you coming out into the field with me? So we want to join in the work of the harvest. 
Now, before my life in the church, uh, I was in sales, and during my life in the church, I meant my, my position here, I was in sales, and the Lord is redeeming all of those years that I spent in trainings and doing all of that work, because I was always called to be an evangelist. I was always called to be here where I am, sharing the gospel with you, but before that, he was making me ready using my job in sales. And he's probably doing the same thing with you. Whatever it is that your job has been, he's using that to put you into the field. And when I was in sales, we would categorize our leads, our prospects, as ready, able, and willing. And you could overcome a lot of objections if they weren't ready. You could overcome a lot of objections if they weren't able. Get creative with financing or, or whatever that is. You could not do a whole heck of a lot if somebody wasn't willing. And so it is with us. I can ask you these questions, are you ready? Are you able? But if you're not willing to go out into the field, then that harvest, that grain, just stays there. And so today, if we move in any way, it's going to be to partner in faith and in agreement with what the Spirit is saying right now. And that is, once again, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. It's big. Swing the sickle. Matthew 9.37 says, He turned to his disciples and said, The harvest is huge and ripe. There it is again. But there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner of the harvest to thrust out many more reapers to harvest his grain. He's not going to push you out if you're not willing. That's not the God we serve. But he's going to tell you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Pay attention to my spirit. I'm moving. And you told me you wanted to go where I am. This is where I am. The harvest is ripe. And so he, he, even when we don't feel ready or able, he thrusts us out. He goes with us. Now, I want you to further get an understanding of what it looks like, because we're going to be talking about harvesting and grain and all that. And so there's a, a video the, the girls and I have watched over and over again. I think her name is Laziki. She's on YouTube. But she has these um, uh, videos that show the whole plant. And she will harvest cotton or beans. And she'll so show everything the way that this plant can be used. And so we have one for the life of wheat. Take a look. Isn't that amazing? It's so good. Such a great picture. That hat that she was wearing, she made out of stalks of wheat. The whole harvest is useful for the kingdom of God and, and is to be brought in. And so as we break this down, as we see this sort of uh, continuation of the process of harvesting, we need to dig in a little bit so that we are ready and equipped and know what it looks like. And I, I want to use the story of the Samaritan woman to show how Jesus harvested the wheat and then how the Samaritan woman so very quickly de did immediately what she had just seen Jesus do. She didn't wait for the five-step program or the ABCs or all the things. She went immediately and did what she had just seen Jesus do. The first place we need to start, so there's going to be five ways we come into, the, into agreement with the evangelistic anointing. We are coming into agreement with the evangelistic grace in each of us. The first thing that we need to do is to go into the field. Seems obvious, right? Like to go into the field, to actually be where the people are. I was talking to somebody the other day that said, you know, I just buy all my books online now because I don't even want to go into the bookstore because of what I see there. I don't mean any judgment against that, but I think too often we fall into those categories of I don't want to see, I've got my ticket to heaven, so I'll just wait here. Okay, let all y'all go into wherever you're going. But I'm going to sit back and Jesus is saying, oh, oh, let compassion rise in you because you were once them. And so we have to engage in the culture around us. We don't need to be moved by the culture around us, but we do have to be where the people are. So who is the wheat? It is a stranger. It is an acquaintance. It's a neighbor. It's a friend. It's extended family. It's immediate family. For Jesus, the Samaritan woman was a stranger. He didn't know her. 
And where is the wheat? At Overflow, we have sort of this joke that goes around that says, even at the grocery store, years ago, we just kept saying that over and over in a video we were recording, even at the grocery store, even at the grocery store. But I think it's a prophetic word for Overflow Church. Could you imagine seeing people set free and healed of every sickness and being delivered and being saved in the grocery line? Wouldn't that be something? That's where we are. That's where the people are. So where is the wheat, the grocery store, the ball field, the dance class, the workplace, the neighborhood, mercy Jesus, the family reunions? In your own home, some of the greatest joy I've had in my life is leading, Mickey and I, leading our daughters to the salvation of Jesus Christ. For Jesus, the Samaritan woman was at the well. So he was going from one place to another. And on his way, he had to stop through Samaria. So his disciples leave and go into the town where the people are. They go to get food. And Jesus stops at the well. And he's sitting at Jacob's well as this woman approaches him. And she's there to get water. And so as we think about being in the field and engaging in the field, this means that we are not just passers-by. See, Jesus stopped there. He saw the woman. We are not of those people who drive by the field of wheat and admire it and go, isn't that beautiful? Man, somebody should get out there and do something about that. We are not in the vehicle with our windows up, admiring. We are not admirers. We are workers in the field. To me, the the picture of this is really what we often do behind our screens. Instead of a glass in a car and we're driving by the fields of wheat, we stay behind our screens because that's, that's a little bit less engaged for us. We put out what I want to say and then hide. See, we're meant to be face to face. If we weren't meant to be face to face, then Jesus would not have come down face to face to be with us. But we are meant to engage with people, to see their eyes, to feel their hands, to know their heart. It was unnatural what's been going on this past year, isn't it? That's straight from the enemy. That's not from God. He wants us to be face mask off, not disease ridden or fearful. And we thank God for masks, right? We thank God for all those precautions. But we were meant to be engaged with people, close up. Because we have to hold the wheat. We have to lay hold of the wheat to make that cut. Our hands get dirty. They get callous. They get sore. You may get a splinter. It might be hot. It's going to be uncomfortable. But you are meant to hold on to that wheat, to lay hold of it. And that means to know their story. When you're face to face, you get to know someone's story. Jesus began to do that with this woman and found out what did she need? What was she looking for? What did she want? What was she passionate about? What did she understand about the kingdom of God? What did she understand about herself? He starts engaging in questions with her. And he first asks, may I please have a drink? In John 4, 17. He says, may I please have a drink? Or can I, please can I have a drink? And this is so important because the woman could, in that culture, was not going to approach him. He was both a Jew and a man, and she was a woman and a Samaritan. So in order for them to start a conversation, Jesus had to be the one to approach her. See, you don't always know the anointing that you carry. And with that anointing, you need to be the first one to say, Hey, how are you? I noticed you. I see you. We've lost that art of asking questions, of engaging in conversation. I think sometimes we've realized that we have the answer who is Jesus, and so we have all the answers, and so then we forget to ask the questions. Like, do you need Jesus too? So we do this through a few different ways. And the purpose of this is to find out in love, of course, and with compassion, who they are. What's your story? I want to know about you. 
genuinely. What are you missing? What do you want? What do you need? What do you love? What was the Samaritan woman looking for? She goes to the well because she needs water. Jesus engages with her right away saying, I need water too. Let's talk about that. We're both here. So this can be a friendly engagement between strangers or acquaintances at the grocery store. It can also come through relationships, somebody that you've already known or, or established a relationship with, or maybe you've even lost touch over the years. We can begin to, to walk back into their lives and say, you know, I did see something on Facebook about your um, mom that just died. I'm so sorry about that. Do you want to have a cup of coffee and talk about how much you miss her? What you love about her? I'd love to hear more about your life. That takes some time and some energy, but that's you being in the field, knowing that the hopelessness that they have can only be met by Jesus Christ. Another way is through a word of knowledge. We're engaging through a word of knowledge. Now we see Jesus continue in conversation with this woman, and he asks her this question, um, what about your husband? And she says, I have no husband. And he said, that, that's right. You've had five husbands, and the one that you're living with now is not your husband. How did he know this? She didn't confess this. He's used as a vessel by the Holy Spirit to speak words of knowledge, something he didn't know before, and now he knows through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is an amazing, amazing opportunity from the Holy Spirit to know something that you couldn't have otherwise known, and he, and he uses that to make himself known. Not to make you look amazing, though you will, because you're like, what is this power that you've brought me, Lord? This is something else. But it is from the Holy Spirit. And as he gives you those words, there's an opportunity to practice spiritual discernment. This is so key for us when we're out in the field is spiritual discernment. So we see this really beautifully in the book of Acts 9, where Saul has scales over his eyes, and he's told that Ananias is going to come meet him. And Ananias is told in Acts 9, hey, Ananias, I want you to go meet, go to Straight Street. You're going to meet this guy, Saul of Tarsus, and you're going to help him out. He's got scales on his eyes, and I want you to pray for him. And Ananias, though he is willing right? And God can do a lot with our willingness. He's also a bit concerned because he's working out this spiritual discipline of listening to the Holy Spirit. This is all new for the believers. He's like, yeah, I'm down with that, Lord. I just want to make sure that you know that Saul of Tarsus is persecuting all the believers, and I'm a believer. So are you sure? And so the Lord is like, yes, this man is my servant, and he's going to see how much he has to suffer for my name. And can you imagine the weight of that, the honor, the privilege that Ananias has because he leaned in and listened? And he was spiritually discerning what was going on. Was this my thought? Was this the enemy? Is he setting me up? Or Lord, is this you? I just want to make sure because I'm willing to go wherever you lead me. And so there's a practice of spiritual discernment, a trust that's being built between you and the Lord as he trusts you with more of the harvest. So we have one hand on the wheat. Our other hand holds the sickle, the tools that he has given us to swing and make the cut. The sickle is your story, your identity in Christ. How you were one way and now you're another, and the middle part of that was Jesus. How everything turned around because of, the, of him. And this is called gospel fluency, speaking the gospel from your own life into whatever situation you see. So it can be simply this, I was broken, Jesus loves me, I let him in, he made me new. I was hopeless. My story is, I was hopeless. I was lost. I had made a mess. Jesus loves me so much that I gave it to him. 
and he made it all brand new. He cleaned everything up. I didn't have to hold one broom. And see, before we start to disqualify ourselves, I want you to know that the gospel fluency doesn't hinge on your personality. It does not hinge on your personality, on your ability to stand on a stage and say something. It's meant for all of us. He told everyone to go into the world, to preach the gospel, to baptize, and to teach his ways. No one is excluded from that call, nor are you disqualified. So the best picture I can give you is my dear friend, Karis. Whoever I am, Karis, in all of her beauty and power and strength, is quite the opposite. Both in where she is in life, her age, her um, ability to capture images. I'm a terrible photographer. Um, just her giftedness, her talent, the strength that is within her. She is such a powerhouse. When I was in um, sales, I was given this nickname uh, as I began to get um, better at this job as a velvet sledgehammer. And the Lord has been redeeming that word because I really believe that's who he's always called me to be as an evangelist, to bring the truth and the gospel, which is powerful, right? But to bring his compassion and his grace around it. And as I thought about that, I thought about my dear friend Karis and how Karis is so very different than me. And yet we're called to the same place. See, Karis has been on all four trips to Haiti that we've taken. She's the first one to sign up. She's to, I have about a thousand of her pictures. Her heart for justice and the lost is the same as mine. Her approach is vastly different because of her personality. But wherever we find ourselves in between those two spectrums, in between the spectrums, we're still called to the same thing, to preach the gospel, to go into the field. And so if I were to give Karis a name, which I prayed about, I just saw her as this wild oak. Strong and confident, natural, but unexpected. You see a wild oak, and it's been growing and maturing over time. Karis has a maturity at her age that I did not have. She has wisdom. She's a treasure. She's very natural in her gifting. And that's why I think she takes this amazing picture. She just captures that beauty in her maturity and her wisdom. So wherever you find yourself, we're all called to the same place. Now, Karis is so called, and just like that wild oak, she says, though none go, though none go with me, still I will go. And so Karis graduates from USF in May, and in June she will take a three-month journey to Jacques Mel Haiti, where she will intern with the Hands and Feet Project. That is something that she partnered with in faith to say, this is who you've called me to be, Lord. And so I'll go. So she's raising money. So outside today, she has a booth set up where you can buy her pictures. I have some in my house. They're my favorite. Um, she's just such a gifted uh, photographer. So you can help support her mission there. And so regardless of your personality, remember gospel fluency doesn't hinge on that. You've got now your hands full, one on the wheat, one with the sickle. What's our next move, church? We swing. We swing away. We take that risk. We move. We let those two things converge. And that is sharing the story of Jesus. To know that story. Very simply. Because the gospel is meant to be simple so that even, even a child can understand it. And even a child can take it out. And even a child can preach it back to us. Well, mom, didn't you say that Jesus loves me all the time? Why are you so mad? <laughs> I, yes! Preach to me. So we swing the sickle, and simply put, it is, we broke it. We broke it. We broke what he had made. But the Father loves us so much that he sent Jesus, and Jesus came and fixed it. 
See, Jesus is the author of everything in creation, including you and me. And that means that the only thing that can fix whatever we see broken is Jesus. Jesus is the author, and Jesus is the offer. Jesus is the author, and Jesus is the offer. And anything that doesn't coincide with his name does not point back to the gospel. And so it deters from his name. What we do instead is we say, I'm so sorry you're suffering. I know how that feels. And then we miss that middle part and we start giving advice and counsel instead of pointing to Jesus and who he is because he's the only one that can fix it. And so if there's any rhythm to evangelism, there's any momentum that comes as we learn how to swing that sickle more and more accurately, it is found in our ability to recognize the gospel story in everyone, everywhere. It's taking the gospel story and using that in things like your sales job. Renewing all those places so that they point to Christ, so that you can, you can, be, you can meet anybody where they are. We had this method to do this, not the, the gospel, but it works for this, um, that we would use when we were in sales. And it was called Feel Felt Found. It was the simplest way to bridge. And when we use it with the gospel, out of love and compassion, genuinely, it works as well. See, we've spent some time learning their story. And of course we know our story. And now we know very simply the Jesus story, even if we've never read the Bible. And so we can go, okay, I understand how you feel hopeless. You know, I felt hopeless too when I had had an affair and made a whole mess of my life. And then I found myself in an unplanned pregnancy, with an unplanned pregnancy. But you know, Jesus found me in that place at my very lowest. And he gave me a hope and a future. And now I have this beautiful family. But it's because I was first welcomed into the family of God. Would you like to know the hope that I found? His name is Jesus. And so Jesus goes through this process with the Samaritan woman. And he says, okay, we have some things in common. We both want, are waiting for the Messiah, right? You're waiting for the Messiah. Your ancestors have been waiting for him. All of these discussions, you want water. I wanted water too, but I have a better water than you know that comes to me. Do you want me to tell you about what that is? And she's like, tell me about this water that you speak of. And he says, it's the living water. And she says, oh, yeah, yep, we're waiting for that. And then he says, that's me. I am he. I'm the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. And she has what I like to call a jar-dropping moment. A jar-dropping moment when all of this discussion finally comes and she goes, could this be the truth? Could you really be him? And faith starts to rise. Because Jesus is the author, right? He is the author and finisher, finisher of her, our faith. So his, our faith has to start with his name. Our faith has to start with his name. So here it comes bubbling up and she's like, wait a minute. Let me drop everything else that I have and what I thought I needed today because this is it. And she didn't stand around in that moment. This is my favorite thing because here she is in front of God, Jesus, right before her. And I mean, when we think about what would we do if we were face to face with Jesus and he tells us this, she drops her jar and is like, wow, that's great. And she walks away. She doesn't stand around before him. She walks away and she turns to go tell her whole town. He didn't say, stop right there. Come worship at my feet. You need to know all these things before you go back into your town. He says, good enough. You got faith rising in you. Go girl. Go back into that town. Let revival start. So she goes back in and she says, I met this guy. You want to know everything you ever did and how you're saved? I met this man and he told me everything I ever did. Come see him. And they all follow. And revival sweeps through that town. 
Now, when we're in this moment swinging the sickle, this is what Jesus does for us. We go to swing the sickle, and there will be a moment where that person will say, could this be true? And we come in and say, yes, it is true, because it was true for me. It can be true for you. Don't disqualify yourself from the grace of God. Nothing you do is outside of his reach. And so as she turns around and brings them back, the people say to her, we no longer believe just because of what you said, right? You've led us now to Christ. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And just like that, all these people come to know him. And he stays there. And he gathers them in. And this is our fifth way that we move into the field. We gather in the harvest. We don't lay the wheat there. We don't chop it and lay it down and not to keep hold of it. We gather them into this house. And Brandon and the Bay and beyond, we want to gather them into this house. There's a place for them here to be restored and renewed and rebuilt and to understand all the things that they had just learned. And furthermore, not only do we gather them here, but we bundle them in missional communities. Did you see those bundles of wheat lapping over each other? Our missional communities where they each have a, a, a purpose and a function because wheat wasn't meant to lay in the field. If it stays in the field and isn't gathered and fully harvested, and threshed out and restored to the full picture of that one grain seed to be used for all the purposes that wheat is to be used for, then it will die. It will lay in that field, and it will die, and it will waste. And so we bundle and gather in because we are meant to know how to go back out and do this. We are to sharpen and practice the tools that we have to bring the good news, to make useful the sickle that you've been given. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. See, we need community. And the last point I want to make is this. See, this woman drops her jar in this moment. And the reason is... I think. She know whoops. Drop my phone. It's a phone dropping moment. The woman drops her jar because she no longer needs the things of this world. See, her time is better spent not getting those physical needs met, but meeting the spiritual needs of others. She understands this immediately. I don't need any of this stuff. And it's because she had seen Jesus do the same thing. He asked for a drink of water. He asked for a drink of water. And he, she nev he never got it from her. And the disciples had gone out to get him some food and saw him in, engaging with this woman and said, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this right now. You need to eat something. And so Jesus explains it to them and to all of us. He says, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. And he gives another picture of the kingdom. He says, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvesting? See, that's an earthly model. I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. See, I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest if you are willing. If you are willing. By our standards, this woman is not able, and she is not ready. And in all of our church speak, we would say, you need a little bit more time. But the call of God on this time, in this movement, in this moment is, no, nope, the harvest is ready. Where are my workers who are ready to go out in the field, who are willing to go out in the field, rather?
Where are those workers? Will you please stand? The Lord has given me as the missions and outreach pastor here at Overflow Church an evangelistic grace. And that is something from the Holy Spirit. It is not of myself. But I came today because he wants to dispense that to you. He needs workers in the field. People are saying, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I'm not able. But I sure am willing. I sure am willing to let that evangelistic grace rise in me to go out into the field, to hold on to that wheat, to take what you've given me, Father, and to swing, to take the risk that I might hold it upside down because there's people that need you just like I needed you. You close your eyes with me. Is before you receive that, I really believe the Lord wants to restore any broken place, any place where you felt like I was laid in the field and no one gathered me in. That's not to place blame on anybody, but I want to stand as a representative of any church or any minister or the person that led you to Jesus to say you shouldn't have been left there. And I'm sorry that you were. But nothing, nothing, nothing has been wasted. The Father, our good Father, will redeem all those years that the locusts had eaten. You didn't miss a thing. But will you forgive? Will you forgive and release forgiveness to those who have offended you and let those gifts go to waste? The time is now for you to be restored. The second thing that we're going to do is that there is this impartation being offered. And that it's time to send the workers into the field. And if that's you, if you're willing, you're saying, I'm not going to disqualify myself anymore because of my personality or because of how I speak or how I don't speak. I want to go into the field. I am willing to be wherever you want me to be, Jesus. Will you come to the front? Just come right now. For that evangelistic gift to rise in you. There's a person on your mind that you've tried to talk to about Jesus, that you've wanted to tell all the good things, but it just keeps getting messed up. You just, or you're too afraid. You come right now. If there's a place where you have known the presence of God, but he's calling you to greater faith, to just an increase of all that he has, just an increase of that grace, that measure in you to be released, to go into the field for the harvest is ripe. I'm going to anoint your hands that signs and wonders and miracles of every kind will follow you, that your feet would be ablaze like those boots that are covered when you go out into the field, that you would hold the tools that he's given you with great power, with the, with the great anointing of the evangelist, that the gospel would stay simple to you but would bring you great depth Deep, deep, deepness. And that healing would come from your hands as a sign of what is coming. As a sign of God's laboring over his people. That you would see his power in a new way in Jesus' name. 